one of the reasons why it's useful to study Chinese and Indian and Greek philosophy together is that they do share a very similar genesis in terms of what was the society that these traditions came into being in? A society of decentralized power, of small states, where there was free movement between states, where there was a high level of kind of artisanal craft production, which shows in many of these early texts, where there was sedentary agricultural centers that could fund and patronize professional intellectuals. Uh, but that's not the case in, in all of the traditions that I'm thinking of. Keating, and you're listening to Sutras and Stuff. Today on the podcast, how does encountering Indian philosophy make a difference in our thinking about the history of philosophy and about what counts as philosophy? This episode is number 10, the final episode in a series of conversations with philosophers who have taught Indian philosophy at Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, an unusual liberal arts college where students first encounter philosophy through a global two-semester sequence, which includes not just Indian philosophy, but Chinese philosophy. Islamic philosophy, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and works from European traditions. Because this academic experiment is ending in 2025, I wanted to hear from professors who came to learn about Indian philosophy by teaching it in this global context. Most of them were experts in other areas of philosophy first. What did they learn from this experiment? Did it change their understandings of themselves, of philosophy, of the world? Thanks very much for having me. My name is Tom Davies. I am currently a lecturer at Yale and US where I teach philosophy and political theory and some other courses. And I'll be moving on to the Seymour readership in Greek history and philosophy at the University of Melbourne. Unlike many other members of the teaching team that taught philosophy and political thought, Tom came to it with some experience in Indian philosophy. In fact, as a philosopher and classicist, Tom's research interests brought him into contact not only with Sanskrit, but also Pali, as well as a long list of other ancient languages, Akkadian, Old English, Old Norse, Ancient Greek, and Middle Egyptian. We'll return to the last two in a bit because they're crucial for his main area of expertise, which is the Bronze Age background for ancient Greek philosophy, places like Egypt. Well, th there was plenty that I was introduced to through the PPT course, but I had Sanskrit as an undergraduate, and I became interested in philosophy towards the end of my undergraduate education. It was a little bit later on that I started reading texts that I'd been interested in in the Sanskrit tradition in more philosophical ways. But I was, I was primarily interested in the Vedic texts and in the kind of earliest period of Indian literary and philosophical history. And so how does that connect to your interest in Greek philosophy? The bulk of my work looks at ancient philosophy in uh, Afro-Eurasia, so northern Africa and the Mediterranean basin through to about the Indian subcontinent as a network of philosophical exchange that starts getting going in the Bronze Age. What I'm mainly interested in is how how people who are asking questions about the natural world come to professionalize the investigation of these questions and turn them into institutions that can support you know, philosophers as, as such. And this happens, of course, not just in Greece, but elsewhere in the ancient world, in Egypt, in India, in Iran. So I'm, I'm interested in how we can look at Indian philosophy and Greek philosophy together to get a better sense of what it means for a philosophical tradition to come into being and what the causes of that were in these two different places. I asked Tom what he meant by tradition and when something counts as a philosophical tradition. So I think that a tradition gets going when it turns self-reflexive and when they're I, I suppose what I would take to be a tradition is a set of texts in which some of these texts are beginning to comment on or interpret others. This is something that we, we see occur at some point in the history of, of Greek thought and in Indian thought and, of course, in Chinese thought and in some other places. But then beyond that kind of narrow definition of philosophical tradition, I would see everybody is more or less interested in questions that we now study under the guise of philosophy and under the guise of uh, science. So there is beneath these professions or institutions some kind of human activity which can be studied as a phenomenon expressing itself in different ways in different cultures. So what makes an intellectual tradition philosophical? This is an area of significant controversy. 
Scholars have considered whether and how Indian intellectual traditions, which we call in English philosophy, are conservative, backward-looking, largely aiming at preserving and reinterpreting earlier texts, or whether they are more free-thinking, open to inquiry, which goes beyond existing textual traditions. I put this controversy to Tom. Uh, I suppose I disagree with the idea that even in its earliest phase and even in its most traditional text-focused Vedic form, Indian philosophy is conservative in this way. If you take texts that come from you know, the oldest Veda, the Rig Veda itself, you can see processes of reflection on, on the tradition that is taking shape. So if you think of the hymn from the, the tenth mandala, a late mandala, the uh, Nasadiya Sukta, where you get a very sophisticated interrogation of some of the assumptions that have structured Vedic theories of the cosmos before then. So this hymn starts out, Nasadasid, Nosadasid, Tadanim. In in that time or at some time, there was no Asat and no Sat. And this is a term you don't need this explained to you, but I presume it's helpful for yes. listeners. This is a a line that can be heard in multiple different ways. On on the one hand, Sat and Asat in the Rig Veda refer to regions of the cosmos, the above ground area that is inhabited by human beings and uh, good divinities and the below ground area that is the realm of, of demons and the not so good divinities. But it can also be heard just as sat being and asat non being in a much more abstract and philosophical way that challenges some of the epistemological grounds of Vedic inquiry into the cosmos. So, this, this particular hymn is very interested in what is the basis of these claims we make about where the universe came from and how it got going, and who could possibly confirm these claims. It ends by asking if the existence of the gods post-dates the existence of Sat and Asat, of the universe as a whole, how could we have knowledge, who could have knowledge, of the state that existed before then? And um, it, it, that seems to me quite a cheeky, philosophically interesting challenge to the status of the knowledge of Vedic practitioners coming from within the tradition itself. So then thinking about the idea of this term philosophy in English coming from this Greek origin, we do Greek philosophy in PPT and we do Chinese philosophy. And so it's sort of a trio of, of traditions. And I think students, as they go along in the course, come to see differences among these and are, are a bit puzzled as to how to put them together. How would you characterize all of these as philosophy. How do you understand uh, why we can use that term for all these three very different traditions? Right. This is a, a critique that I've... Well, that comes from within the Greek tradition on one hand. Diogenes Laotius famously says that there can be no philosophy outside of the Greek world because barbarian tongues don't even have a word for this philosophia, this love of wisdom that uh, the Greeks do. But it, it's also a criticism that comes from scholars of the Indian traditions who are uncomfortable with the idea that this form of inquiry, which is different, this form of investigation, should be subsumed under a framework that has come out of the Western tradition. I think I have less scruples about that because I don't see philosophy as having, even within the Western tradition, a determinate enough definition or concept that it's really a problem to apply it to other forms of inquiry. And I think there's a certain polemical use in confronting philosophers with the idea that there are large parts of the history of their discipline with which most philosophers trained in uh, Anglophone institutions at least have no familiarity with at all. Tom thinks, though, that those of us who want to learn more about the history of ancient philosophies shouldn't be going on a kind of treasure hunt to find the real sources or progenitors of philosophy. Well, I, I think progenitors is maybe misleading in that the, the, the people that I'm thinking about in respect to my work on, on this book that I'm putting together on the origins of the Greek tradition, they were progenitors of the Greek tradition, or at least they were important influences on how Ionian Greeks came to start thinking about these issues and presenting them in specific forms and genres of uh, investigation. But that doesn't mean that they were progenitors of, of philosophy. I think that the richer way of seeing this is that in these very different social, political, institutional environments, this activity came into being as a, as a professional activity in different ways. One of the reasons why 
it's useful to study Chinese and Indian and Greek philosophy together is that they do share a very similar genesis in terms of what was the society that these traditions came into being in? A society of decentralized power of small states where there was free movement between states, where there was a high level of kind of artisanal craft production, which shows in many of these early texts, where there was sedentary agricultural centers that could fund and patronize professional intellectuals. Uh, but that's not the case in, in all of the traditions that I'm thinking of. So Egypt, for instance, which is very important to the history of the Greek tradition, in my view, is not like that at all. It is a singular imperial power that is organized along a, a very unusual kind of agricultural system along a specific river that determines the, the form of, of, I don't know, how power is distributed and how, how this region of space is administered. And that has different effects on how people become professional scholars of the cosmos. In Egypt, if you're going to be a philosopher, you have to be literate. And literacy is not just a matter of learning a, a, a language that is spoken by contemporaries. It's a matter of becoming familiar through the study of canonical literary texts with um, what is by the time of, by the time these people are in contact with the Greeks, the language that most Egyptian philosophy is conducted in is already a, a dead language. It's a language that you have to learn through copying out and memorizing mostly literary texts. If you're going to be a serious philosopher in this tradition, you have to know the canon. You have to know specific texts. And you have to know commentaries on those texts. You have to know how to talk about them, how to assess their textual tradition in a critical way. That is stuff that develops in the history of the Greek tradition and in the history of the Indian tradition. But in Egypt, it's right there from the beginning. So there is a much, well, it, it, there is a superficial focus, at least, on the kind of synthesizing of numerous different ideas. There's much less explicit antagonism between thinkers who are competing for attention. There is much more of an effort to show familiarity, expertise in, in a large tradition. So many of the philosophers that we can name from the Egyptian tradition are people who collected and edited texts, at least in the later periods. Tom's work then is a kind of philosophy of philosophy or metaphilosophy. He thinks about how philosophy comes about in different times and places. This makes him, of course, attentive to how philosophy is done today and how it's done at Yale and U.S., which is a fairly unusual global manner. It struck him while teaching this course just how differently our students will understand philosophy in comparison to many others. The last thing that, that you read in PPT is an essay by Hannah Arendt on thinking. And uh, it's an interesting essay which people should read. However, when I was reading it, my first reaction was how impoverished the notion of the philosophy of history is in Hannah Arendt's thought. So she, she adverts to Kant and to Nietzsche and then eventually to the Socrates of the Platonic Dialogues. And this is her primary point of reference for the act of thinking. And I think this is a very natural move for Arendt, and uh, not just for her, of course, for most philosophers of the kind of post-war French and German traditions, where within a, a devastating critique of the Western tradition of philosophy, we find this continual entrapment by the boundaries of that philosophy. And as I read this essay, I was just pleased and delighted to think that our students are not going to be thinkers of their sort. They're not going to assume that what happens in the Platonic Dialogues is of exclusive importance in explaining the later history of, of human thought. They are able to move between traditions. They are able to think back to the development of Confucian thought in China or the development of Nyaya thought in the Indian tradition uh, in a way that is really unusual, is really rare, and frees them from some assumptions that I think have exhausted reflection on the history of philosophy in our own time. This is something he hopes to carry on in the future. I will hopefully at Melbourne be designing a, an ancient philosophy course that is not just focused on Greece and Rome, but does uh, draw on the, the Chinese and Indian traditions as well. And the core of that will obviously be the teaching that I've done in PPT. Um, so hopefully some form of that course will live on, not just in what I'm teaching, but in what many instructors are teaching. Mm -hmm.